What's up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 11. Bringing the heat. Welcome, it's another beautiful Sunday. Hope everybody had a phenomenal weekend. Just over here at the house, did some work from home, took a nap today. Is living the dream over here. So, same as usual, ask your questions. I'm here to answer them, bring you as much value as possible. I promised myself I'd do 52 of these this year. Uh, we're now on episode 11, going strong. Every Sunday we're here delivering that heat to help you grow your business. So if you got any questions, put them in the chat. Here to answer them, business related, Amazon related, mindset related. You just let me know. Uh, how much capital do you believe is needed to start making $30,000 in sales a month? I'll answer your first question. So figure average, what was it? $30,000 in sales a month. I know our average uh, cost of goods is about 40% of our sale revenue price. So you're looking at about $12,000. So if you could get $12,000 in capital, um, doing about $30,000 a month is not unreasonable. You could probably even do it with less, $10,000 a month. You could probably pull it off. And then your second question was, and do you recommend taking a loan for the capital? Listen, you don't want to put yourself instantly in debt. You know, you should really start with the money that you have, um, especially if you're, you know, young and you don't really have much funding backed and there's not a lot of money in your bank account. The last thing you want to do is go into more debt to possibly build a business, right? Because a lot of people fail at their first business or even their second business. A lot of people fail at new business ventures. So to go and be like, all right, I'm gonna go take a $20,000 loan and dump it all into Amazon if you have no experience. And that doesn't make logical sense to me. I would encourage you to, you know, put in some action and learn a little bit about the business before you go taking out a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar loan to do so. Uh, just because you're inexperienced, you know, and inexperience isn't good for business. Um, what what grows businesses is experience and calculated risks. And to me, taking out a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar loan with no experience isn't a really a calculated risk. It's a hail mary. So, gentlemen, ask Alberto. I guess we're speaking about Amazon's new inventory limits. So that is a great question. Amazon's new inventory limits. So what they've done, according to their terms of service, which makes logical sense to me, I knew it was coming, um, they removed the ASIN restriction, right? So from COVID, they created what we call COVID limits. And they put restrictions on ASINs where you could only send 200 of this one, 180 of this one, 500 of this one. So it was restricting growth of people's sales because they were limited to the amount of inventory they could send in per ASIN. Right, but they've since removed that, so that's no longer, that is a thing of the past, right? Maybe a thing of the future, but right now, it is a thing of the past. They removed that, and now what they've done is they implemented category restrictions, right? So inventory limits based on category. Now there's six categories. There's standard size, there's oversize, there's apparel, there's footwear, and then hazmat is broken down into two categories, flammable and aerosol. Very simple to see what your inventory limits is. You would go to your shipping queue, scroll all the way to the bottom, and there's two expansions to see what your max inventory limit is. It will tell you how much you're occupying, how much of your inventory limit you're occupying, and how much is left, and then what your max availability is. So for example, I could actually pull it up here. What this has done is open up the floodgates for sellers to send in ASINs that they were restricted on. So a huge complaint that we were coming across, a lot of people sent me DMs, was, hey, this product's selling, you know, 6,000 units a month. I could eat 3,000 of those sales, but Amazon only allows me to send 200. So what people were doing was they were sending in 200, replenishing it, FBA, sending in another 200, throttling FBM, um, and they were just repeating that process over and over and over again. So so now that problem is removed, but what people are running into the issue of is they are having low max inventory limits. So for example, I know some people who sell footwear products, right? They have a 10,000 max limit footwear space and now they're already maxed out so they can't send any more 
inventory into the footwear. So let me see. So it's restock limits and it's storage volume. So inventory limits, I'm looking at it right now. So in your restock limits, they have utilization quantity, which is how much inventory you're actually utilizing. So how much space you're occupying, how much inventory you have in Amazon's fulfillment centers. And then they have your max inventory level, which is the maximum amount of inventory that you can send into Amazon, right? So like that's the max, can't go more than that. That's what they're saying your max is. And then they have your maximum shipment quantity, which is what's left, right? So that's simply taking your maximum inventory level, subtracting your utilization quantity, and then getting your maximum shipment quantity. So your maximum shipment quantity is how much inventory you could send back into Amazon. But it's pretty straightforward here. I'm looking at our inventory limits. We're, we're sitting pretty healthy. We're at about a 25% utilization of our standard size, uh, maybe 20% utilization of our oversize, and uh, we don't have any apparel or footwear. That's not really our MO, but also we're maybe at 10% utilization of flammable and less than 10% utilization of aerosol. But you wanna pay attention to these. And now the big question is going to be, for a lot of you, like I'm maxed out, my maximum inventory level is hit. What do I do? How do I deal with it? Now the best way to deal with it is keep that max inventory as close to max as possible while still selling through inventory and still sending in shipments, right? And then what you're gonna to wanna to do is reach out to Amazon and ask for an increase in your storage limits. And what this will do is prompt them to review your account. And if your metrics are healthy and you're moving inventory and you're making sales and you're replenishing your fast moving SKUs, they will consider increasing your max storage limit. Now that's the name of the game, get your max inventory storage limit increased so you could send more products to Amazon. The last thing that you want to hinder your growth is a max inventory limit that's set on your account. Then you'll have to switch SKUs to FBM, which isn't the end of the world, but you really want to be leveraging Amazon's fulfillment network by using FBA fulfilled by Amazon. It's how our business consistently grows all the time. We personally as a company, we've actually stopped all fulfilled by merchant orders for the past six months and have just been going heavy on FBA. So that's a little breakdown of the inventory storage limits. If you got any additional questions, hit me with them. I'm here to help. So this woman or gentleman said, I wish I could have met you in Orlando. So as far as meetups, networking events, I'll be in Houston doing a networking event, I believe the weekend after Mother's Day. So I think Mother's Day is May 9th, maybe. The, I think it's the second Sunday in, in May. Um, so the weekend after that, I'll be doing a networking event in Houston, Texas. And then sometime in the next two months, we'll be having one in New Jersey as well for all you Northeast sellers. So we'd love to have you come out. Is it better to get distributors or to manufacturers? Our volume is about 50K. Yeah, so this is a common misconception that most people don't quite understand, but it makes super logical sense and I'm gonna break it down for everybody and explain why it makes logical sense. So most of the times you're gonna find products cheaper from wholesalers and distributors than they are direct from manufacturers or brands. And the reason why is, let's say me, little old me, reaches out to said manufacturer, right? Let's just say Procter & Gamble. I know they have very high inventory. Um, order limits and stuff like that. You gotta get full truckles, but we're just gonna use them for example. So little old me goes to Procter & Gamble, says, hey Procter & Gamble, I'd like to order whatever, a truckload of your Old Spice deodorant line, right? So I put together, I get 50 cases of this, 400 cases of that, 600 cases of this, and I order one truckload. As a little old me, just regular old Amazon seller ordering one truckload from Procter & Gamble, right? And they give me a set price. I'm probably gonna be at their highest tier price because I'm not ordering a lot of inventory for what they consider a lot of inventory. Same thing would go if you're reaching out to a manufacturer and you're getting 10 cases of this, 20 cases of this, 30 cases of this. Now what a wholesaler and distributor will do, they'll call up the same company, they'll get on the phone and be like, hey Procter & Gamble, I need 100 truckloads of your Old Spice deodorant line. 
So who do you think is going to get the better price? They're going to be tier one pricing. They're going to be at the lowest price possible because they're getting a hundred times more of the product than I'm getting. Little old me getting a truckload. Wholesale distributors buying a hundred truckloads, 200 truckloads, 500 truckloads because they're distributing these products to all these different companies, brick and mortar stores all across the country. So it's 95% of the time it's more cost effective to get your products going to wholesalers and distributors than you would go manufacturer direct. Now, where manufacturer direct relationships come in is if you're working with them directly, you've built a relationship with them, that's when you can start getting negotiated pricing, have them start funding your advertising budgets, right? And really communicate them with what your wants and needs are. And then also having them communicate with you what their wants and needs are. That's when the manufacturer to third party seller relationship really is able to flourish. Do you think the toys business could be an all year business or would you recommend doing other categories? Listen, at the end of the day, you never want to focus on one category. Yeah, toys is an all year business. People are buying toys all year round. Uh, kids always want toys, right? Adults always want toys. People are always buying toys. Now, Q4, definitely heavier toy season. But I recommend all of you diversify your product selection and your category selection. So I encourage you to sell in baby, industrial and scientific, sports and patio, outdoor, health and beauty, gourmet grocery, everything, all those categories. Why not? Why would you just limit yourself and be like, I'm only going to be a toy seller? Yeah, you might have great connections with toys, but imagine diversifying your business and expanding 15% of your catalog selection, 20% of your catalog selection into these different categories. To me, more categories means more money. We just brought a new buyer on. She's really diving into a new category that makes up maybe right now 1% of our total sales. Her goal is to grow it to about 15% of our sales. So, you know, you're talking 15% on 45 million, you're talking a lot, right? You're talking $5 million in sales that she wants to grow this little old, you know, couple hundred thousand dollar category for us into $5 million category for us. So it's all about diversification. Steven89 said, Eric, how helpful is using a conveyor belt scale to weigh case packs during prep? So unless you're implementing the, the conveyor belt into your production stations where you need the conveyor belt to allow your employees that couple extra seconds to handle the product, getting a conveyor belt scale just for the scale aspect is not efficient. But if you're gonna implement it into your production stations, then absolutely it could be helpful and it could weigh the product as well. We have a Cuba scan, which is the same system that Amazon uses. It gets dimensions and product weights of boxes. You just put it through and it uses sensors to document all that information. But right now we're not even using it because we just take ASIN weights and we multiply by case size. It's, it's pretty straightforward math. I mean, that's how we calculate our, our case sizes. And we make sure, you know, anything that's 45 pounds or over needs to be reported to a manager and signed off of before we ship it to Amazon because the last thing we need is an Amazon shipping suspension because we're sending 52 pound packages, 53 pound packages, and Amazon flags our shipping services because that's, that's happened to us before. We've been shut down for, you know, three, four, five days, and it's just not good for business. What do our employee salaries range from? They're broad spectrum, anywhere from 30 to, you know, 100 plus thousand dollars. Uh, depending obviously on the position and your how long you've been with the company you know how much how much work you put in how much you help grow the bottom line how much your efforts help grow our profits has a huge role in what you pay we also incentivize a lot of our team members we incentivize our entire warehouse we incentivize our buying staff so the more money they make our company and the more inventory our warehouse produces the more money they make examples of items that don't need prepping let's say this right this is what this is nuts and washers let's say you're going to send this just as a one pack you just put an fn skew right over this it doesn't need prepping there's no prep guidance in, in needed for this just an fn skew you don't have to poly bag it you don't have to bubble wrap it you don't have to tape it there's nothing you need to do to this but add, add an fn skew so that would be an example. Usually one packs or products that aren't liquids or glass are, are products that do not need prepping. I've been having problems on increasing profit margins for the business. I've started buying products that will give me at least 50% on profit on the cost of purchase. 
is this strategy the best? So Homeboy right now is having problems increasing profits. Um, he's not running a profitable business. And he's changed his strategy to only purchase products that give you 15% on the costs. You're talking about 50% ROI. Um, so what I would do if I were you, and, and listen, we've turned literally companies around. We've taken, you know, through our mentorship and training, we've taken Amazon businesses that were non-profitable to now they're pulling in, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars a month in profits from from almost negative profits monthly in a short time too. I'm talking six, seven months. We're able to help them turn around their business. And how I can help you turn around your business is by understanding your numbers. There's a few numbers you need to understand. You need to understand your average profit per ASIN and your production cost per ASIN, your PCPA. And now why these are important is because that 50% may seem logical, right? 50%, I wanna make 50% on my cost of goods. Let's say cost of goods is $4. So you wanna be making $2 on that inventory cost. But let's say you don't understand your PCPA, your production cost per ASIN. Now you're like, okay, this $2 is good. I paid four for $4 for the product, I'm making $2 on it. But you don't know that in your warehouse, after you pay all your employees or in your living room, after you pay you, your sister to help you package these products and you pay for shipping and you pay for boxes and you pay for you know labels and all that stuff, it actually costs you more than $2. Um, in production costs to get that product out the door. So you think you're profitable, but really you're not because that $2 is getting eat up in production. So it's crucial to understand these numbers. And what we do is we say, and I encourage you to do, we have a minimum and the max is to the moon, right? Our minimum is 10% gross profit margin. Right now, if your company's struggling, you might want to increase that a little. You might want to go to 15 or 18 or 20% to try to grow a little bit. Right, but also you have to understand it's like where are you in your business? Are you in month one? Are you in month six? Are you in month nine? Are you in month twelve? Because in the beginning, first couple months, it makes sense if you're not profitable. You're just getting your feet wet, you're getting your toes in the sand a little bit. You know, playing around, making moves, learning the systems, learning how it operates. So you gotta also consider that. But what you need to do is really set some minimal buying criteria. And then whoever's buying your products, you need to make sure they're buying the right amount of inventory, not buying the wrong inventory, and purchasing the inventory properly. It's important. The growth of your business starts with whoever's purchasing your products. If you have someone who's straight trash purchasing your products, your business is gonna perform like trash. There's just no way around it. It's just, it's guaranteed to happen. So this person said, how do you rank on wholesale products versus private label products? So private label, more like a launch strategy for private label, right? You gotta get some PPC ads out there, maybe do some giveaways, maybe some social media links, reach out to some influencers. You really got some, get to get some traction to your listing to get it closer to that top page on page one. So people are seeing your product, purchasing your product. More purchases, the lower your rank is, right? And then the more organic purchases, even the lower your rank is and the more sales you get. And it's just like this wheel of, of traction that happens and it just keeps growing and growing. And if you can keep your inventory in, it just, boom, you're set. All right. Now, wholesale, what we look for, we're not looking for wholesale products that we need to rank. We're looking for, and you should be looking for, listings that are ranked well already. Right. So a lot of people, once again, they don't understand the ranking system. Like They don't understand their profits. They'll have like, uh, I don't buy anything in gourmet grocery that's ranked over 20,000 or I don't buy anything in toys that's ranked over 50,000. It's like, no, 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 no. I, I encourage my buyers and myself, I look at things ranked 300,000 because a lot of times there's huge opportunities in those products. Because yeah, it's ranked 300,000 but it's selling for $80 more than it should. So I can drop the listing price 60 bucks and still make $20 on it. Do you think a $60 pricing decrease will decrease the ranking of that listing from 300,000 to maybe 80,000? Absolutely, it's overpriced. It's not customer friendly. So what we're doing in wholesale and what you should be doing in wholesale is looking for products that are ranked well already. What printer do we use for FN SKUs? We use the Zebra GK 420D. Uh, it's about a $450 printer. It outperforms Dymo. Uh, what are some of those other ones? I forgot the names of them, but all day. We have, in our warehouse, we have 18 of them that we use on a daily basis in our warehouse. They're amazing. Zebra GK420D.
that's the printer we fuck with. It's really the growth printer, right? Dymo's like introductory printer. It's, you know, 150 bucks. Uh, so it's like, if you're just getting started, then that's like, that's the go-to, right? You don't have a lot of money to invest in your first printer. And I get it, people, I get it, I get it. But the Zebra GK420D is just integrates so well, especially when you're, you know, beginning to scale and grow. Like we have 18 of them integrated into our system right now and we're just flying. When you do a removal order, you get a bunch of packages with random numbers of units in each carton. So you know a way to find out the number of units in the carton without opening the carton. No, you have to open the carton. In the carton, there's a packing slip. And on the packing slip is the removal order ID. And you could search that removal order ID in your reports tab and it will tell you what was in that removal order. That's the best way to do it. And this is a side note. If there are products that are damaged from shipping from a removal order, what you do is you take a picture of the removal order packing slip and the damaged product and you would send those pictures to Amazon and let them know and then there's a chance that they may reimburse you for that. What is your advice when dealing with national distributors that only have case UPCs, so GTINs, on their Excel sheets? Communication, communication. Now, I'm not sure what a case UPC, so a GTIN is a 14 digit number, right? And a UPC is a 12 digit number. Now off the top of my head, I'm, I'm pretty sure from a GTIN you can get a UPC, but from a UPC you cannot get a GTIN um, because it's a mathematical equation. I'd have to look into that and get back to you, but the best thing to do would be communication, right? Ask them. It's funny because all of a sudden, this happens to us all the time. We meet a company like you're talking about, right? And like everything's amazing. We see they got a great catalog, but like they just give us case UPCs and not UPCs. And it's like, fuck, you know, I thought this company was gonna be amazing. But all of a sudden you do some research, you do title searches on Amazon, you put together a $10,000 order and then you put together another one. And then all of a sudden your account rep calls you and say, oh, Eric, hey, we, uh, we have a file with UPCs in it, you know? And it's like, because they, they just, they have it, but they don't, maybe you didn't place an order with them yet. So why are they gonna give it to you? You know, what incentive have you provided them for them to give you your their entire catalog with, with UPCs on it? It's gold, it's gold to them, right? That's how they make their money. But you, you haven't spent any money with them yet. So what, what incentive have you delivered to them to be like, I wanna give this guy our entire list with all of our UPCs? So sometimes you gotta put in the legwork. How to win the buy box when you're a newer seller and have the best price and shipping. So winning the buy box, definitely you wanna go broad and have a larger SKU count so you have more opportunity to win the buy box on assorted listings. Also a great way to even lower your current list and possibly win the buy box is to run a 5% coupon. I don't believe there's any repricers off the top of my head that recognize coupons and reprice for coupons. So let's say you're at $20, you run a 5% coupon bringing it to $19 dollars the repricers that you're competing with won't recognize that coupon so your floor price could be at twenty dollars but your listed price would be at 19 because that five percent coupon and that could help you win the buy box also you can enroll and subscribe and save you can do you know volume discounts where if they purchase one they get it for a hundred percent of the price if they purchase two they get it for 95 percent if they purchase three they get it for 85 percent so on and so forth these are some tips and tricks to win the buy box you could also run a small ppc campaign Amazon loves to allocate the buy box to people who are running PPC campaigns because let's say there's three sellers all at the same price on a listing, me, you, and somebody else. I'm running a PPC campaign. The other two sellers aren't. Every time Amazon gives me the buy box, they make an additional 15 cents off every click from my PPC campaign. High chance they're going to prioritize me in the buy box because they want that 15 cents. That's additional revenue. It might not seem like a lot, but I'm just one seller. There's millions of sellers out there. So, you know, you do the math. That 15 cents adds up rather quickly. Do we buy our four by six labels or do we get them free? Um, listen, if you're just getting started, there are places to get them free, um, but there's no way we can get them free. Right now we use about 12,000 four by six labels a week. So there's no way, no, nobody wants to give us 11 to 12,000 four by six labels a week for free. That would be amazing. If you know somebody who's willing to do that, let me know. So this gentleman asked, where can you get the Zebra GK420D? Did you search Amazon, bro? It's literally the first thing that pops up.
I don't know where you're searching, but it's I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, so the link will be at this bottom of the video for the Zebra GK 420D. Um, and just search Amazon Zebra GK 420D will pop up. How often we're we using scanning software versus manual searches. So we we scrape all of our catalogs in software, and then we also do manual searches after that. Well, a PPC campaign is a pay-per-click advertisement. It's Amazon's form of advertising. This question is good. How do you enroll your products and subscribe and save? So search subscribe and save in the search bar in Seller Central. Um, Amazon, you used to be allowed to request products that you want enrolled in subscribe and save. Now uh, they've limited really the opportunity for subscribe and save. And there's some prerequisites. Um, we could actually pull them up real quick together. Subscribe and save. Eligibility requirements for subscribe and save. To participate in the program, you must have an FBA account in good standing, effective December 18th, 2019, so over two years ago. Enrollment of new products is limited to brand owners. So they've limited subscribe and save in order for you to see if your product is in, can be enrolled in subscribe and save. They've limited to brand owners. So if the option to enable subscribe and save does not appear in your settings and you believe that you have eligible replenishable items, contact selling partner support. Now, what you can do is I've noticed that when I try enrolling certain products for subscribe and save, they do not pop up. Other products do pop up. So there are some opportunities where Amazon, if they have pricing history and sales history of your products that are selling well, they will allow you to roll and roll them in subscribe and save, even if they're not brand registered. But in order to enroll any of your products across the board in subscribe and save, they need to be brand registered products. Uh, they use a UPC scraper to go through large lists. Uh, Scan Unlimited it will be linked at the bottom of this video. You can check it out. You can get 50% off. Do we subtract warehouse expenses from gross profit per unit? Yes, that would be our net profits. So all of our expenses, uh, taking your gross profit, which is profit before expenses, subtracting your expenses would give you net profit. So it's important to understand both numbers, right? And what you're subtracting is your production cost, essentially. So let's just say, hypothetically, I have a great YouTube video right here, too, that breaks all this down. But let's just say, hypothetically, your gross profit is $4 and you subtract all your expenses and you're left with $2. That means your production cost per item, your PCPA, production cost per ASIN is $2, right? So it's an important number to understand. And why is that so important? Because that means if you're not making more than $2 per sale, on average, your company is not profitable. Um, no, we, we stopped doing FBM. We did FBM for years, made up maybe 5% of our total sales. Uh, but now just it's FBA so lucrative, we really went heavy on FBA and, and we've stopped all of our FBM production. We've actually removed, we had about 30 racks in our warehouse just for FBM products. We removed all those racks. We liquidated all the inventory at the flea market, donated a lot of it and just got rid of it, sold some to our employees and our staff and just got rid of it. It was just, it's just, we wanted to go all in on FBA. I appreciate your time spending it with me. Let's have a beautiful rest of your Sunday. It's another episode, Sunday Sessions, Epi 11. We're here every single week helping you grow your Amazon business. I appreciate you all being here. Have a beautiful rest of your weekend. Stay grateful and stay lit.